much for the invitation to be here. Um, so I'm Lucille Bloomberg and I'm from the National Institute for Communicable Diseases and I'm an infectious disease um, consultant. And I'm very happy to introduce you to Dr. Jeremy Null, who's the uh, president-elect of the Infectious Disease Society and um, head of infectious diseases at Helen Joseph Hospital and the lead author on the uh, national guidelines for clinical management. Um, third person is Dr. Audrey Cook, who's a, I think a specialist pulmonologist, intensivist, and is based at, um, in, uh, in Alberton, and has dealt with a number of uh, cases that we've referred to with query COVID. So I think the focus tonight is, is this COVID or is this not COVID? And so we've put together a number of interesting cases. I think as we move down the epidemic curve, the number of cases are decreasing, but they haven't gone away. So I think importantly, we must ensure that we don't miss cases and some present a little uh, more unusually than the uh, COVID pneumonia. We'll talk a bit about that. And then some cases come as query COVID and turn out not to be. And uh, I think we need to start thinking much more broadly about the differential diagnosis um, so that we don't miss um, other uh, cases that, that also need urgent management. So Chris, if you'd like to show my slides, I think I'll start and then we'll move on. Okay, so let's go to the second slide. So the NICD uh, collects um, statistics and data on a daily basis um, of all COVID positive laboratory confirmed cases, both from the private sector and the hospital sector. And these are hospitalized and patients um, who are not in hospital. And you can see um, we reached the peak for the country in the middle of July and uh, Cape Town led the, the march. Um, but since then, it's been a downward um, curve and uh, uh, there's been a marked decrease in cases. So I think at the height, we were getting more than 10,000 positives a day. Um, now we're getting less than 2,000. The testing strategy has changed. So I think earlier on, you know, everybody who coughed or sneezed or uh, was worried about COVID got tested. Um, we've moved towards prior prioritizing hospitalized patients and healthcare workers with symptoms. So that does affect the positivity rate. Um, but there's no doubt that the, uh, the cases are declining and that's good news. I think importantly, we'll have to wait and see as the lockdowns have been released and people think it's party time, whether we'll have like many other countries, uh, a resurgence that's um, watch the curves. But I think importantly, let's go to the next slide, please, Chris. Um, we are looking at hospitalized infections. So even if we don't test in the community, and that's the reason why the cases are going down, if you look at hospital admissions, you should still get a sense of, are we uh, moving on, moving down, or are we still seeing um, a severe pandemic? So we have the DATCOV surveillance system. It started off as a sentinel hospital system uh, in the private and public sector. It's now moved um, and is moving to capture COVID cases in all hospitals. So it's the national hospital system. And you can see even there, um, the number of cases are, are decreasing um, quite uh, significantly, which is really, really good news. The outbreak's not, down, not gone, um, and I think we still have some months to go. So a couple of interesting cases. Next one, please, Chris. Chris, are you there? Okay. Uh, yeah, change the slide. Right. Oh, it's a bit, bit slow to change, never mind. Okay, um, so this is an 18 year old patient who presented to a clinic in northern KwaZulu Natal with fever and body pains. Uh, it was at the, um, at the beginning of the surge in, uh, in South Africa. And of course, you know, everything was COVID. Um, they sent off a COVID test. It's quite some way from a central laboratory. There was no result. Patient went home, came back the next day um, with severe respiratory distress. So obviously that fitted with the diagnosis of query COVID, was referred to the, the local hospital. 
was admitted to the COVID uh, PUI ward and um, X-ray wasn't done because, uh, you know, patients uh, have to be in isolation and uh, they hadn't quite got their services together. But I can show you what it would have looked like. But a full blood count was done on this patient with a working diagnosis of COVID. And uh, a very astute doctor noticed that the platelets were quite markedly decreased. White cells were down. Certainly you can get a leukopenia in COVID. You can get a slight decrease in platelets, but that's a little unusual. And uh, immediately thought, is this COVID? Patients in respiratory distress, but perhaps it's something else. And did a malaria test. And in fact, it was severe malaria. Did a rapid malaria test. Um, so we don't have an idea of the parasitemia. And unfortunately, the patient died. Next slide. So this was a missed diagnosis of, of COVID, uh, a, missed, a missed diagnosis of COVID and a misdiagnosis. Um, a misdiagnosis of COVID. You see, I'm even getting mixed up. And uh, the malaria was missed. And yet you can see in severe malaria, you can get an ARDS. The top left picture, in fact, is the ARDS, ARDS that you get um, with malaria. Uh, the picture on the right is COVID. And although there may be some subtle differences um, in, in, in the, in the X-ray picture, you know, I think if you look at that quickly, and many of them are portable X-rays, you may not see a difference. So I think the key messages here is we're moving into the malaria season. Malaria control has not been very good. Many of the usual winter activities have not taken place. I think malaria control as we move into the season is going to be delayed, particularly with spraying. Uh, there are many challenges. And if it's a traditional malaria transmission area, please think of malaria. There are two reasons, at least for respiratory distress in malaria patients. The first would be a metabolic acidosis. Um, so the respiratory rate would be increased. Obviously the X-ray would be normal, but you can see you don't always have uh, access. And then the ARDS, which uh, is a complication uh, in some patients, particularly pregnant women, often develops two or three days into the, uh, after the onset of the uh, progression to severe malaria, and obviously has a very, very different uh, management uh, protocol. So just think about malaria. Next one, please, Chris. Next patient is um, a South African who's working on an oil rig uh, off the coast of Lagos. Um, there are quite a lot of people working on the oil rig and you can imagine they live in very close proximity um, and uh, they do have shore leave. Nigeria's had an outbreak and a lot of cases of COVID. So, you know, it is possible that they could have brought COVID back uh, to the oil rig. Next one, please. He, um, it was time for him to come back to South Africa and um, they put them in a compound in Lagos um, for two weeks and then sent them back to South Africa and he was quarantined as his practice in a hotel in Johannesburg. Almost at the end of his quarantine, um, he was due to go back to George. He developed a fever. Um, there's no routine testing uh, after the 14 days or it wasn't done. And um, they, they sent him back to he was very anxious to go back to George, and I think he might have not told anybody he was ill at that stage. He presented with high fevers um, after five days. He said they came every afternoon. But of course, when he went to hospital, the first diagnosis considered was COVID. He's come from Nigeria. No one took much notice of the two weeks that he'd had of uh, you know, the, the uh, quarantine. Um, but the chest x-ray was normal, and two COVID tests were negative. He was really quite ill, he had a low platelet count, his white cells were dropping, his livers were rising. So they thought he had sepsis. Um, put him onto Piptaz and added doxycycline for some, you know, some unusual organisms that he might have picked up somewhere along the way. He came to our attention on the 23rd because he'd come from Nigeria and uh, he was referred to me as a PUO and is this some sort of unusual um, infection that he picked up in, uh, in Lagos. Next one, please. Um, I was told that two malaria smears were negative. Um, you can see the white cell count there and the uh, laboratory um, results that I've mentioned, low platelets, low white cells and dropping. Blood cultures were negative at 72 hours. The malaria smears were said to be negative. And I was told that a PCR was negative. 
you know, if someone comes from a malaria endemic country and the smears um, are negative, you still need to think about malaria. And I think if you are able to do a PCR, it's very useful. So the thoughts were then, you know, what else could he have? Another COVID test was done, perhaps it's a, some unusual presentation, but I think by then we weren't thinking on that line. And they wanted a lasser test. Uh, it certainly didn't look like mon monkeypox, low platelets, low white cells, raised livers. But, you know, he couldn't have got it on the, the oil rig, you get it from rodents. And um, it was unlikely that he got it in the compound in Lagos. There haven't really been outbreaks. So um, I said, are you absolutely sure about the malaria? Let's review. Next one, please. And um, so the malaria tests were reviewed. And in fact, they hadn't done a PCR, came back as plasmodium ovale. And when we looked at the, 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 the blood, um, in fact, we looked at it here, it was um, real evidence of uh, plasmodium ovale. I think non falciparum malarias are not always easy to diagnose. The rapid tests are not particularly good. Not everybody has access to PCR. Um, there are often very few parasites, and uh, you know you may mistake them as um, as funny white cells. But there was very clear evidence of Plasmodium ovale. He got treated with artesanate. People don't always recognise that Vivax and ovale can present with severe disease. Um, he got artesanate. Temperature settled, but um, was supposed to get primaquin uh, once they got hold of it, and uh, he made a, a full recovery. So don't just think COVID, uh, think about where patients have come from and think much broader in terms of respiratory um, symptoms in, in patients who, um, who live in risk areas, particularly for malaria. So I'll stop there and I think it's on to Jeremy's presentation. Not everything is COVID that might look like COVID. Thanks, Chris. Next presentation. Cool. I'm just loading up. Wait a second. Um, here we go. Okay. And you get the misfortune of seeing me too. All right. <laughs> so uh, thank you and thanks for the opportunity to present uh, this evening. So I'm going to show you a couple of strange COVID presentations. So Lucille's shown us two cases that weren't COVID. I'm going to show you some that were, but were a bit unusual. First one is not so much unusual as it is really um, a diagnostic dilemma always. And that's this hypoxic, hypoxemic patient with advanced HIV disease. So this is one of the first cases we saw at our hospital. This was a 47 year old female um, and she presented with a day's history of acute delirium as well as a four day history of cough, dyspnea and vomiting. She was known to be HIV positive. She'd been diagnosed for the first time two years ago, but she'd never started antiretroviral therapy. And we didn't have a CD4 or viral load. Um, and she uh, had, no, had no previous medical admissions despite this. So on examination, she was febrile. She had a marked tachycardia. The respiratory rate was up as well. And her room air saturations were 89% so low. She also had hepatic lesions on her lips. Um, she was in clear respiratory distress with all sorts of uh, accessory muscles being used, nasal flaring, um, and she was delirious with a Glasgow Coma score of 40 under 50 without any meninges or focal signs. Um, and really nothing else on examination to find. Um, her CD4 came back as 132, um, and her blood gas done on admission really just showed a respiratory alkalosis, so just from breathing really quickly, and, and which made sense. Um, her lumbar puncture was done because she was delirious with HIV, but she it came back as normal. And that's her x-ray. So you've got this sort of impression there of a bilateral process, mid to low zone predominance and ground glass looking. So with that sort of x-ray, the patient's history of being HIV positive with a low CD4, 132, and hypoxemia, it really puts a sort of diagnostic dilemma together because PCP or PJP, is one possibility and she certainly have hypoxemia from that she could certainly have the bilateral ground glass changes and also the lymphopenia with pjp as well um, in terms of the hiv and COVID presents the same hypoxemia bilateral ground glass infiltrates and lymphopenia is well described and a marker of severity in COVID 19. so what do you do when you're faced with that possibility of, of these sort of overlapping syndromes well, there's a couple of things that you could look at which would help guide you. The CD4, more than 200, certainly 
significantly more than 200 makes PJP quite unlikely. Almost all of the diseases under 200. You do get a few cases above it, especially if there's something else on board, like corticosteroids or something. But in, for the majority of cases, under 200. So yeah, if it was 230, I wouldn't rule out PJP. But if it was 540, that would make PJP very unlikely. A second thing, and a really underutilized thing on history, is whether the patient is on Bactrim prophylaxis, cotramoxazole. If you've been taking Bactrim prophylaxis pretty well, and if you've been on it for more than about a month, it makes PJP very unlikely. This is a very good preventative therapy for PJP. So if you're on it again, it makes it very unlikely. Beta D glucan can be useful, so that's a fungi tell. Um, if it's significantly raised, it favors PJP over COVID, but remember that it's non specific, other fungi can do it. You can get false positives as well, including with things like beta lactam drugs, like Augmentin or something. So it's not, again, as, as great as it could be, but it's certainly a point in favor of PJP if it's strongly positive. And then, of course, again, a PJP on sputum, if you send it off and it comes back positive, well, that more or less makes your diagnosis secure in the context of everything else that this patient presented with. But again, it's not the most sensitive test when you're using it on sputum, and we can't really um, bronchoscopy, you know, to do bronchoscopy on these patients is very difficult. Sputum induction is not recommended in the COVID epidemic. Um, so really, you, you, you've got those pointers to guide you. But in some cases, it really is very hard to tell what's what. And so in the appropriate context, in other words, your CD4 is low enough that PJP is a possibility. They're not on Bactrim prophylaxis. And they've got these chest infiltrates with hypoxemia. Well, then you should probably treat for both. And that's what we recommend in our national guidelines too, at least initially. And you can always walk it back. I mean, it's easy two days later if you get a firm answer to just decide to stop BJP treatment or COVID treatment. But it's often in the, in the time they present, they're in such distress that it's worthwhile covering for both if it's, you know, if it's in the compatible context as I've listed up there. And that would include steroids for moderate to severe cases of BJP, really for anyone with hypoxemia. And once, if you do get a COVID positive result, you could consider stopping PJP treatment actually, because it's unusual to have more than one infection in COVID. That's a finding we've become more aware of as time's gone on. It certainly doesn't rule it out completely, but personally I've you know, felt confident in these sort of settings if it looks more like PJP, sorry, it looks more like COVID to stop the PJP treatment if you get a COVID result that's positive. So what did we do with this patient? Well, we did a urine legionella antigen, it was negative. Beta D glucan came back as negative, and that's pretty helpful because a negative beta D glucan fungital it has a very good negative predictive value. Uh, so it rules out PJP pretty close. Um, and then also to support that, the PCR was negative and the COVID PCR was positive. So again, it really does look like in this case the patient had COVID, not PJP. But the lesson here really is it's very hard to tell these two entities apart in the patient with advanced disease, with advanced HIV. And if it's reasonable to assume that it's, there's a reasonable possibility of either condition, well then treat for both. And again, you can always walk that back, like I said, two days later, three days later, if you get more results and you want to stop the treatment, then that's fine. But missing PCP treatment for three or four days can really be very detrimental to someone who comes in hypoxemic. Um, I've said that the effects of HIV on COVID-19 are currently unknown. That's still true. We have a bit of data now from the Western Cape to suggest that HIV is associated with roughly twofold increase in death. It's the only place in the world to find it, but then um, you know, the, the number of patients in the Western Cape cohort were somewhere over 100 times more than everyone else in the world's put together. So I think if we're gonna find it anywhere, you're gonna find it here. All right, so that's, a, that's a kind of one scenario. I'll show you two uh, shorter other scenarios. One is a patient with myocarditis. So this patient's 24 years old, we saw him a couple of weeks ago. He'd had a five-day history of cough, shortness of breath, fever, chest pain, which was almost pleuritic, in, in hindsight, pericarditic, um, and fatigue as well. So again, he presented with low saturations on, uh, on rumen. The fact that those were set on, on a poly mask, which is somewhere north of 80% um, inhaled uh, oxygen concentration. Um, the blood pressure there was normal. His pulse was surprisingly low for someone who had quite a lot of uh, hypoxia and distress. He had some crackles bilaterally, um, and he wasn't in failure in, in terms of his cardiovascular exam with a regular pulse and rhythm and normal heart sounds. What did we see on his ECG though? Well, we'll come to that in, the, in terms of his, um, his bloods. You see there marked leukocytosis, which is actually quite unusual for COVID, at least uncomplicated COVID. 
pretty much all neutrophils, as you can see there. Um, the CRP was moderately up, um, his, and he had quite bad renal failure. Now, he did have a degree of underlying renal failure, um, known before chronic kidney disease, but this was a lot worse than his baseline. Um, there's also his troponins, his cardiac enzymes really came back strongly positive at 2,500. But notice through PCT, the procalcitonin was pretty low. That's his x-ray. Um, again, not a great x-ray. This was a portable unit that the you know, patient was sitting, so not the best quality. But you can get the impression at least you know, of some bilateral changes. Uh, again, roughly symmetrical towards the mid to low zone. So again, compatible with COVID. I mean, you wouldn't say this was the best x-ray to show it, but certainly wouldn't rule it out in the height of the COVID epidemic. He has his ECG. Worth having a, a brief look at. I'm going to give you just 10 seconds and I'll, I'll point out what, what it is if you can't see it, if your screen's a bit small, but worth having a crack and seeing what you see first. So there's a couple of findings here. One is that he's got these diffuse ST segment elevations. So you can see the shape as well as kind of, you know, uh, uh, concave, um, and it's in many leads. You've got V3, 4, 5, and 6. You've got 1, 2, and 3 in AVF. So really here in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 leads out of 12, um, this ST segment elevation, which again, in that many leads, suggests that it may be myocard or myopericarditis, really pericarditis, rather than um, ST segment elevation. You've got one other feature here that suggests pericarditis, and that's PR depression. So you can see in the circles there, that little segment, let's choose a good example. Let's choose this one in lead two. You can see how that part of the segment is markedly lower than the baseline over here. I hope my mouse is showing up. But you can see that. So the combination of PR depression plus diffuse ST segment changes that you can see over there is pretty much diagnostic of um, pericarditis. And he had an echo, his echo showed uh, left ventricular dysfunction, or EF of 30%, small as a fusion anteriorly, sorry, I spelled that wrong, <laughs> he's another F, and then um, his left ventricular wall thickness was slightly increased. So his COVID PCR became, uh, came back positive two days later. And so what I wanted to show you, so this was an example of COVID-induced myocarditis. And there's a really nice article that came out uh, three or four weeks ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, put a link to it at the bottom there. But it really, it, it describes the spectrum of cardiac abnormalities in COVID-19. So if you have a patient with COVID-19 who has new onset cardiac dysfunction, what are the possibilities? Well, one possibility is this thing called stress cardiomyopathy. Now that's been known in other conditions, typically older women following some emotional stress, and you can see it, it's this takotsubo, as they're called, it's sort of an uh, octopus trap. Um, and you can see from the shape of, this, of, the, of the trap over here why this condition gets its name. This is the heart, the inside of the heart, and you can see that it, it's got this apical ballooning in the majority of cases. So the part of the bottom of the heart, the apex, just kind of bulges, and that's really unusual when you look at it on, on an echocardiogram. Really nothing else looks like that. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that you've just got a sort of a myocardial infarction because your heart's going so quickly and you've ruptured a plaque. You say, in other words, you had underlying bad cardio, uh, coronary vessels, but now you've had a myocardial infarction. Might be some role for microvascular thrombi two in COVID, but not quite sure of that. Um, and then we know from other conditions as well that if you have massive inflammation, you get a multi-system dysfunction, and that can include the heart. So that's one possibility. But the fourth possibility, which is the one that this patient had, is that the patient has a sort of myopericarditis. So you've got involvement of the myocardium, the heart muscle. We know it's got ACE2 receptors in it. Those ACE2 receptors are the things that COVID binds to. So we understand that COVID can get into heart muscle. And the thought is then that you have inflammation and then myocardial dysfunction on that basis. In other words, this is probably, although I mean the etiology is still to be sorted out uh, fully because this is a new virus, but the probable etiology of myocarditis is probably the direct viral infection. So this COVID-19 binds to the receptors, enters the heart muscle, and then you get an inflammatory response to that, which damages the heart. So that's what this patient had. It's a really nice uh, example of it. This patient ended up um, uh, requiring, so he required all sorts of things. So for his, his lungs and his hypoxia, he required high flow nasal oxygen. 
Um, he went into third degree heart block ultimately uh, and required some pace, uh, you know, temporary pacemaker inserted. He required dialysis for his renal failure, which got worse, and he had all of this during ICU. The good news with him is he actually did really well in the end. He, he had a really rough course, but he came out the other side uh, in, you know, thanks to some good work in the intensive care unit um, and did really well. Okay, so that's the second kind of unusual presentation. And the final one uh, is this patient, which you may well be familiar with now because it's really so common in a way, although it wasn't appreciated early. And that's what COVID does to the diabetic control or glucose control, I should say. So this patient was 53 years old. They were known with diabetes and hypertension, came with a few days history of dyspnea and fatigue. Um, the random glucose there was 38 millimoles, so it was sky high. I was dehydrated and a bit delirious, morbidly obese, had some scrack, uh, scattered crackles. Uh, the venous blood gas was done, which showed a metabolic acidosis, and the urine showed three plus ketones. So this was a, a diagnosis of diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, it's a condition you're all familiar with, but the interesting thing, again, just on one slide to finish this off, is this idea of COVID-19 and hyperglycemia. So it, we know bad infections of any sort can push up your sugar. Cortisol rises, the glucose rises too. But there does seem to be a lot more of it in COVID-19. And there's a couple of possibilities, one, one of which is just the stress or infection-related hyperglycemia. But we know, interestingly, that there's also ACE2 receptors on the pancreatic beta cells. Those are the cells that make insulin. And so if the virus infects those cells, the ability to make insulin is presumably impaired and you get a, a resulting hyperglycemia. Now, it really is well described from all the clinicians on the ground that many of these patients come in with very high glucoses. Um, you can have a protracted ketonemia, and there's evidence for that now. In other words, compared to normal, these patients are harder to get out of DKA. Um, we've certainly seen new onset diabetes. As so someone who's kind of been on the border has been pushed into frank diabetes from COVID-19. And then we've also seen lots of hyperglycemia, sometimes quite profound hyperglycemia, in people with no history of diabetes. If you do the HbA1c, it comes back stone cold, normal five, they're really miles away from diabetes in, in normal life. But they've been pushed into uh, either hyperglycemia or sometimes even overt diabetes from nothing. And it's unusual and we don't know, we, you know, people are looking at this longitudinally to figure out, is this going to be something people recover from? Do they go back into not having diabetes? It's certainly something you have to watch when you manage patients with COVID. Um, you have to really be quite on top of their, their sugar, uh, you know, their glucose monitoring and keeping it in a reasonable level. And we know as well that these, this was one study just to finish off with, which I, I think came from Japan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it was, this is in patients without a previous diagnosis of diabetes. And you can see the mortality on the left here. So the higher is worse. And then you can see in the colors are what their, um, their, their sugars were really when they came in. And you can see those with higher sugars, and that's really not that high. Seven is pretty actually up a little bit of normal. Um, and people with just on the high side of glucose, it ended up being associated with increased mortality. Now, it doesn't mean directly it causes increased mortality, but it's certainly a marker of severity and a marker of death. And again, it's not, again, you must be careful with interpreting this. It's not necessarily to say that if you have tight control under seven, you're going to, in, you're going to reduce the mortality. That, that may well be false. And in fact, it may rebound and, and be bad to do that. Lots of re research going into this at the moment, but it's certainly true that having a high glucose on admission, if you weren't a diabetic and you have COVID-19, is associated with increased mortality. So those are three kind of slightly unusual presentations. But like I said, if you've seen enough COVID patients, you will recognize this third case at least. Um, it's very common to have high sugars, and very difficult to get on top of, and we're not entirely sure what the best management is of the face of COVID, or even indeed what causes it. For the PJP and uh, versus COVID distinction, again, I've emphasized it's difficult to tell the difference, but where there's doubt and reasonable doubt as to which is which, you can treat for both, at least initially. That was a much bigger problem in the beginning when we weren't recommending steroids. Now, at least for COVID, whereas we were for PJP, now it's much less of a problem. And in the middle case, the myocarditis is much more rare, but pretty well described too. And it's important to be aware of the possibility that COVID can do that too. All right, I think that's me. Thanks very much.
Thank you. I think it's Audrey now. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, just trying to get my slides up at the moment. Thank you very much. I just wanted to mention that um, I'm not a pulmonologist or an intensivist. I actually am just a specialist physician in private practice. And uh, we've also had our share of very interesting cases um, in the last few months. Um, it's kept us on our toes. So um, from our side, um, the first patient was a Mr. AJB, 49-year-old guy. He's uh, traveled from the Sudan um, in Darfur, and um, he had a fever, shortness of breath, myalgia, and a spiking temperature for the few days before coming to hospital. Um, when he was there, although he was a smoker, he couldn't smoke because he couldn't get cigarettes, and he was vaping with whatever he could find um, in the stalls in Darfur. Um, so those, those points were definitely addressed with the patient because... Uh, as you know, the, the kind of complications that can happen with vaping, especially when you don't know what exactly you're vaping with. So he presented with a temperature of 39 degrees. His respiratory rate was 30. He had a tachycardia of 110. Uh, D-dimer was elevated at 4. Ferritin was high at uh, 1,100. LDH was 317. His CRP was 78, and his platelets were on the low side. So the reason why Lucille got involved and Mandy uh, was because they thought this could be a viral hemorrhagic fever because he also had an insect bite. He in, also had elevated transaminases, 110 ALT, AST 55, not massive. Uh, normal bilirubin and gamma GT alkfos were normal. This was his um, admission x-ray, so not very remarkable, even though he was uh, short of breath um, with a tachycardia. And with the high D dimer, um, he was sent for a CT pulmonary angiogram, which was found to be completely normal, as you can see on the screen there. And so, uh, so the workup started. Blood cultures were negative. His hepatitis markers were negative. Um, malaria slides were negative from the first laboratory in, in the emergency department. Um, but they basically only tested for fal uh, falciparum. COVID was negative on two occasions. And it confirmed then on a subsequent different lab that he had Plasmodium malariae. Um, he had an excellent response to co um, asymptomatic on discharge. His chest x-ray was clear. And because of the elevated D-dimer, he was kept on a course of Xeralto, especially because he traveled recently, even in the absence of the uh, CT pulmonary angiogram showing any evidence of um, pulmonary emboli and he had a full recovery on treatment and subsequent follow-up. Um, he had a normal lung function test and um, no evidence to uh, suggest any sequelae. And so again, it just brought the point that Lucille made earlier that um, again, with a fever, tachycardia, shortness of breath, uh, of course, the first uh, consideration was COVID um, and this was not your normal falciparum but when the laboratory specifically looked for um, other causes, uh, other types of malaria, the malaria I was diagnosed. Uh, the second case is also interesting. It's a Mrs. G.A. She's a 36-year-old lady. She presented with a history of worsening dyspnea, uh, tachypnea, pleuritic chest pain. She had a negative COVID test with two different laboratories, which she insisted on doing. This patient was quite uh, distressed about having possible COVID and she kept on saying there's no way she can have COVID. And she was actually hysterical in the intensive care unit because um, she didn't want to be amongst COVID patients. On the same day, a third lab test showed a positive COVID test. And I'll show you now why we went ahead with that. Her fever initially was 38.5 degrees. Chest x-ray showed um, initially just patchy veiling. Um, in the mid zone and basal region on the right hand side. A CT, can, a CT scan of the chest was done and this showed a mass like consolidation in the right upper lobe. She had a wet cough but um, no hemoptysis. Um, a CRP was markedly elevated 315. White cell count was down 3.6 and mainly, mainly a neutrophilia. CO2 on the uh, UNE was 17 and uh, anion gap of 14. She was severely hypoxemic uh, on first admission with a 64% um, saturation in the emergency department. 
Her IL-6 was elevated at 5.75, her D-dimer was 2.31, and she had a ferritin of over 2,600. Um, she was treated on non-invasive ventilation, and in spite of her protestations, uh, we were treating her as COVID, including giving her Actemra, especially with the high leukocyte count, uh, IL-6 count, and um, the CRP as well as we did cover with antibiotics at the same time. And initially also, uh, as we were concerned about a possible PCP, she was covered for that as well. Um, the initial X-ray was really not very uh, remarkable in spite of those uh, clinical findings with the raised CRP and the low white cell count. This was the CT scan. As you can see, this was done, uh, the previous X-ray was the, the evening. This was early the next morning. And you can see this mass that um, is present um, mainly in the, in the upper lobe region of this patient. And then uh, the second day, this was the repeat chest X-ray. As you can imagine, at this stage, she was um, severely compromised. Uh, we were on non-invasive ventilation and um, she was treated at this stage with the Actemra, as I've mentioned. We also treated her with dexamethasone. She received vitamins and also low molecular weight heparin to a one milligram per kilogram, aiming then for a factor 10, a level of uh, one. And um, this was her uh, repeat chest X-ray. Sorry, the slide seems to be superimposed on the pictures. Um, but this was after uh, six days on treatment, the repeat chest x-ray you can see had improved remarkably. And on um, follow-up at my rooms, she had a, a complete recovery and a normal, close to normal lung function test. So COVID or not, you decide. Thanks very much. Thanks Thank so much. Go for it, Chris. <laughs> No, go for it. I was going to say thank you. Uh, I'm not sure how you want to handle the next part and proper maybe you can direct us. Do you want to just keep it open to the panel for questions or do you have a, a proposed uh, structure? No, I think it's, um, it's open for questions. And okay. um, I um, have the, the first question actually to Jeremy. Um, what other unusual presentations have you seen? Um, what about neurological presentations? And how many have had, um, or to, to Audrey, um, how many have had uh, obvious respiratory complications? Because I think um, that is an issue. It's a really good question. So, I mean, thrombosis in general is, is a well-described feature now. So venous thrombosis and arterial thrombosis. In arterial thrombosis, some of, you know, they all sorts of things from critical limbs occasionally, but the most common arterial thrombosis is a stroke, like you said. So the patients presenting as a stroke is, is not uncommon um, in terms of COVID. It's not, you know, not the most common, but it certainly is well described. Um, I must be honest, the ones I've seen and the ones that I have um, seen published as a case series have generally had respiratory symptoms at the time or just before, you know, a couple of days before. It's usually been yeah. kind of part of a big syndrome. I, I don't know that it's very common to present with neurological symptoms without anything in the chest, but I'm sure it could happen. I mean, we just don't know enough about this. And I'm sure even some of the people on the call will have had experience, I'm sure, with people presenting with strokes without really anything else to say COVID. Hmm. Yeah. So I think yeah. the important message is, yeah. Audrey, so are you? The lung, lung complications, we've seen quite a few patients with uh, fibrosis um, on chest x-ray and also impaired lung function test on follow-up. I spoke to Clifford Smith this morning and he's also seen quite a few patients uh, with this as a complication. And this seemed to be people who had a very bad uh, clinical course and who had very high inflammatory markers. Um, it's difficult at this stage whether the um, tocilizumab made a difference on those patients and it's something that we're watching whether on those patients who they, they all obviously recovered, they could come to the rooms for a lung function test. But uh, we've had two patients that have stayed on, on oxygen at home because they were so impaired. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, they now, some, one of them is four weeks down the line and he, he still requires oxygen, supplemental oxygen. So quite severe. And yeah. we've also seen stroke. We've had uh, neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, as well as um, um, 
a patient presenting with uh, a new onset um, epilepsy, possibly related to an ischemic event in the brain. Yeah. So <clears throat> your advice then would be any um, any patient is presenting with um, a thrombotic uh, incident, we should really test for COVID and look a little more closely at a, um, at the uh, at the lungs. I see something on the chat about a. Uh, also it became psychotic and a history of depression, um, COVID, PCR positive. There are very few false positives. I think false negatives um, because of, you know, perhaps not perfect sensitivity is an issue. But the other thing we're seeing is um, <clears throat> our post-COVID chronic fatigue syndrome starting to appear. And although, I mean, there are many, many causes of, of this kind of syndrome, I think that's, that's a, a space that's going to be quite busy. And because they weren't tested um, during you know, the mild illness that they had, because we're not testing everybody, um, I guess possibly a serology test may be helpful, although there are you know, sensitivity and specificity issues around serology for confirming past infection. Um, but that's a, another area. Perhaps we can go to the chat and some, some questions. Chris, do you want to, to raise them? Sure, I've seen a question. Hand raised by Nazreen. Nazreen, I'll unmute you now if you want to verbalize your question. You should be able to unmute, hopefully. Hi, um, this is Professor N. Mohammed. I'm actually a radiologist at the University of Batfatis Front. Um, so we, uh, and I work in a public sector hospital. Um, so my question to the panel is, what do you, um, I mean, we've looked at the um, international uh, literature on um, extra pulmonary manifestations of COVID. And um, I want to ask, what is your experience um, in your setting on the extra pulmonary manifestations? Um, and, and then I'll come to the second part of the question. Uh, Jeremy, I think you've mentioned some of them. Are there any others that are... Um you can consider? So I mean, the, the sadness in a way is that the ACE2 receptor is very widely distributed through the body. So it's really possible to infect most organs. And I think that what we're starting to see as the months go on is better and better evidence that almost any organ can be infected. So certainly if you look neurologically, the brain can be directly infected. There's a sort of encephalitis and encephalopathy, which has been described. Um, the same with the spinal cord, we mentioned the vessels, um, which are a prominent role in COVID-19, and that obviously can affect then any organ through the vasculature. Um, we've mentioned the heart directly, the pancreas directly, there's intestinal manifestations too. Um, There's even one case I'm aware of in the US where the patient had um, uh, sort of a, well, it was a peritonitis actually, which they think is likely, which is very uncommon, but very likely to be COVID-19 because they biopsy the peritoneum and there's virus all over it. Um, I'm probably forgetting a bunch, but I think, I mean, I wouldn't bet, it's one of my rules in, in medicine is never bet against a virus in terms of kind of do a, a symptom or a syndrome. Um, you know, these things with viruses, they tend to go in every organ. And this is no exception. I, I don't know, Adri, if you and Lucille, if you've got other thoughts, but I mean, I, if, if someone said to me tomorrow, oh, there was a, a new eye infection associated with COVID, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Adri, <laughs> anything else? Um, was surprised about was um, we didn't see the 15% in, in my case series for sure, uh, we didn't see the 15% uh, renal failure that was reported from overseas. Um, almost all of these patients had elevated uh, liver enzymes. Um, we didn't see, uh, we did on some patients with confusion, looked at brain scans, but um, they, they were mainly related to the fever rather than any neurological deficit. So there weren't any other, uh, uh, you, you know, apart from X-ray CT findings on the chest, any other um, organ systems on specifically from a radiology point of view that we picked up specifically. And of, of course, we forgot to mention, uh, the skin, you know, as well, these, these sort of COVID toes and, and a variety of rashes. And then, of course, in children, this Kawasaki-like syndrome, which, again, is a multi-system. Yes, uh, and I don't think we've so, seen... So I think that's, that's my question. Um, in children, uh, we are seeing the post-COVID inflammatory syndrome and they're presenting with um, de um, hemorrhagic and uh, demyelination as well as the um, Kawasaki's like uh, picture and uh, myocarditis. Um, 
but specifically in adults, I wanted to know what was the prevalence of stroke uh, related to COVID because there's been a, a, a few uh, papers uh, out of um, the US on stroke in, 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 because we are not seeing stroke really in the Gauteng area. So the, that was the, the, the real um, crux that I was getting at too. Stroke in COVID patients. Yeah, I had uh, two patients with uh, with new onset strokes um, and confirmed on scan. So um, and and but both of them had very high uh, D dimers on admission and quite a high inflammatory response. So high interleukin six, for example, as well as ferritin and LDH. So um, Jeremy, I'm not sure from your side. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing in you know the COVID epidemic in this country is that we have such a young population relative to other countries, and, and people don't realize that you know when you look around <laughs> the country, you know we we have one of the youngest populations in the world on average, and that's because of the tragedy of HIV mostly. But I mean, even so, certainly obviously much younger than New York and, and Italy and places like that, but much younger even than China. And so, you know, I, I see it as quite likely that we have maybe fewer strokes than, um, than other countries as a, as a total you know, percentage population because the vasculature in a younger person is just less amenable to that, or despite, you know, the, the thing. But, I mean, we certainly have seen strokes. I mean, I, I agree with you, Audrey. I mean, I don't know that anyone can put a number to it in terms of prevalence at the moment. and uh, It's a lot harder to do, but we've seen it. I mean, I'm looking at the chat as well, and we've got uh, Jennifer Pups, for a radio, a rheumatologist, saying that, uh, you know, they've seen some polymyositis uh, and other colleagues have mentioned Guillain-Barre syndromes, certainly seen one of those with, with that. And then uh, reactive arthritis has now been published. So yes, and again, I think that's a, another important place, you know, in terms of the joints with viruses as well. So, I mean, again, I think, again, I think it'll be very hard to convince me that this can't do any particular syndrome, as unhelpful as that is in some ways. Um, the last point I so the last point I had was that as a radiologist, um, the Radiological Society of North America developed a classification system for interpreting chest X-rays and CT chest for COVID. But what we see in the South African population is a very mixed um, radiological um, pattern. We're not seeing the classic, uh, and you showed the example early on with the perihyla uh, mass light lesion. So we're not seeing the classic bi-basal ground glass infiltrate oh, yeah. that, uh, that uh, goes into or progresses into dense consolidation. We're actually seeing um, different, uh, a different spectrum. And that's one of um, the, the papers that we're working on now from the Johannesburg setting. And I think, um, I mean, your thoughts, but I think that could be related to maybe comorbidities and um, maybe a different geographic um, you know, setting, and and it's just Africa hasn't been really studied that well as a continent. Um, we have fifty percent of the the patients, COVID patients, in the continent. So, yeah. I I think that um, if you look at the um, uh, patients, the at the um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, the majority of patients had this uh, basal the basal infiltrate, and when you listen clinically, they all had crepitations at the basis. And it's one of the ways you could monitor whether the patient was improving apart from their gases and, and their respiratory rate. Um, I found that the oxygen saturations and the pulse rate was sometimes, as, as Jeremy said in his patient, was low. Um, it's the patient comfort level that really helped us to distinguish it. But clinically, it's the crepitations when you listen to the base of the lung. So I must say the majority of our patients had, had those classical features with a ground glass appearance. And sometimes the, the you know, you, you just, they, they wouldn't even bother almost with the COVID test. Of course, you had to do the COVID test, but uh, you could almost make the diagnosis just on the, the clinical and the x-ray features. So I must say we, um, the comorbidities that we've seen mainly have been a cardiovascular hypertension, diabetes, um, obesity was, was um, in the private sector definitely have been um, the, the biggest um, comorbidity numbers that we've seen. And my particular group of patients, I, I've seen up to yesterday 278 patients and the 10 uh, mortalities that we've had, all the, all the patients were over the age of 60 uh, with comorbidities 
So <clears throat> we, we have a series of probably almost 80,000 patients from the hospitalized patients. And part of the, um, uh, part of the aim of, of collecting hospitalized patients was to look at the clinical picture and the complications um, and the comorbidities. And I must say for the most part, and I, I think Jeremy can add to it, it's been the classical COVID presentation of ground glass appearance, respiratory, um, some patients with extra pulmonary, um, but for the most part, it's been, you know, what's been seen elsewhere and the uh, classical comorbidities, as you've mentioned. HIV, TB, definitely associated with slightly uh, more severe COVID, but for the rest, it's obesity, uh, diabetes, I think right up there and, and probably cancers. So I think we, we are seeing a lot of classical COVID that, that's been seen elsewhere. I just want to comment, there was a question about the, um, the test that with two labs were negative on the same yeah. day, and then the third test was picked up. Um, that was also difficult because, uh, again, we almost had to convince the patient, and because she was, she was absolutely hysterical, we had to actually sedate her initially because of her fear of it being COVID. We had to move her to a high care unit because she wouldn't stay in the COVID ICU. And we then had to just protect the staff. Um, I don't know. I mean, again, you just have to go on the presentation and, and then, you know, almost just consider that maybe the other labs, I don't know whether the swap wasn't taken the same. I think to me, that's probably the reason why the, the one lab didn't pick it up. Um, yeah, so, so we've had a number of patients where the first swab is positive and then the patient decides, well, this can't be, you know, what exposure have I had or I don't want COVID, send it to another lab the next day and it's negative. And then you see it's negative and then you have to make up your mind. It's very much dependent on the quality of the specimen. Um, mm. And that is a problem. Um, and then I think PCR is not 100%. It's the the time it takes to get to the lab, it's the extraction, um, it's how it's kept um, en route to the lab, how long the specimen has been stored. You know, there've been a lot of uh, backlogs earlier on. So, you know, at best, I think um, PCR has performed probably about 70 to 80%. And I think if one of them is positive, uh, it's positive. You also have to look at the test that's being done and how many uh, um, kind of genes come up. Um, but I think if it looks like COVID and it uh, you know, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and there's an outbreak of COVID, it is one and you need to regard it as positive and, and follow up as one would uh, in terms of infection prevention control and the public health response. I think as we move out of COVID um, into other diseases, uh, which are, I think have been sitting on the back, on, on the sidelines and, are, and are, are not being controlled and I think are going to make a reappearance, you know, I think those lab tests then become just a little more, a little difficult to, to decide. But I think one positive has to equal a, um, a, a positive, and I'm sure you would agree. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly it. I mean, the test is, as you said, probably maxes out somewhere 70, 80 percent sensitive. So you certainly get a lot of false negatives, and and you know, if you high, if there's a higher suspicion, you should you know repeat a sample. Yeah. But as you say, the, the test is so specific. And, you know, that you, for functional purposes, there's no such thing as a false positive. In other words, if it's positive, you treat it like it's COVID. And it's not, you know, it doesn't help to go and try and confirm it with another lab because if it's negative, mm -hmm. it's likely to be false negative. We know in actual fact, of course, there's always ways of getting some false positive in the lab contamination. <laughs> for all intents and purposes, a positive result is, is COVID. And you really, there's no real way to disprove that. You know, that, that it's not like another test will help if it's negative. And we've seen that sometimes early on as well with people who are asymptomatic, you know, and they say, oh, well, it must be a mistake because it didn't have any symptoms. I mean, we now know that there's, you know, many people have no symptoms. And so that's, again, another reason to just trust the positive results. <laughs> if yeah. you're asymptomatic and it's positive, you're in luck, but that doesn't mean you don't have COVID. Yeah. So there are um, a lot of serological tests that are now out there. Um, some are point of care and the orange gene has been uh, licensed, although I think it's only being provided um, through the NHLS. And then of, of course, a number of labs are doing the uh, lab-based ELISAs for serology. But these do not take the place of PCR in patients with acute symptoms or where you need to diagnose um, COVID pre-op or whatever. Um, 
they, they really are only positive two to three weeks after the acute um, illness and they're quite useful but not foolproof as a, as a look back. Um, so I think we're still finding the place for them. Um, in patients who are repeatedly negative and have got a COVID-like illness and perhaps a little further on in their illness, PCR is perhaps the viral uh, load has gone down, you know, is there a role for serology there? That's something we, we really don't know at the moment. So I think we shouldn't be using serology at all for diagnosis. I think in, in children who've got the COVID inflammatory syndrome, it may have a role because they're often PCR negative. Okay, so I think the, yeah, Jeremy? I'm oh, sorry, I was going to say we've got a question about the experience in the pediatric population. So. Um, I mean, again, Lucille, you're probably more in touch with because I only really see adults, but I mean, I think from a discussion with the pediatricians, they've seen again, more or less, you know, what's been seen elsewhere in the world. In other words, they've seen certainly the Kawasaki-like syndrome that's, that's been described in South Africa, you know, in Cape Town and Johannesburg and other populations. Um, and they've seen some of those sort of, you know, potential COVID toes, <laughs> whether you believe that or not. Chill blains. Um, <laughs> In yeah. children. Um, but I think it's been compatible with what we've been seen elsewhere. I mean, is that your impression too? And, and Audrey as well, if, if, if you've had any yeah. experience. So, so we have collected pediatric data on our um, co uh, DATCOV hospital system. It's a pediatric working group. We have several hundred children who've been admitted to hospital. The ones with more severe COVID have been those with comorbidities. So I think um, cancers, um, occasional asthma, not a lot. Uh, some congenital syndromes, um, but, uh, but, but very few with severe disease. Um, and uh, I think we've looked very carefully in it, at them and we're about to publish a paper which we'll share. It's going to be in the NICD bulletin, I think. But very few, very few with severe disease. And that includes those who've gone back to school. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Not a lot of childhood infections yeah. in general. But um, there, there are quite a number of the uh, inflammatory syndrome and uh, that's a, it's a glowing, you know, the, the PIMS. Um, um, and I think there's a, Jill, you want to comment, Jill? you the pediatric ID on this, on this call. Do you want to make some comments? Uh, let me see if I can unmute that quick. <laughs> well, mostly GIT symptoms, some neurological, cerebellar, and shock like Kawasaki. Yeah, okay. I mean, we've had, um... We've had about uh, 10 cases of Trehima Musa. Um, the commonest way they present is um, rash, GIT, they, they can present as an acute abdomen. In Cape Town, there were two appendicectomies on children. <laughs> um, and then the scary thing is that they, they become shocked quite rapidly and they often have cardiac, cardiological, uh, cardiac abnormalities. So uh, myocarditis, pericarditis, um, one child's had a mitral valve, valvulitis, so prolapse. Um, and then we had one child who came with cerebellar signs and speaking to other pediatricians, they've had kids presenting with uh, encephalitis, hemiplegias, and they all recover. They have normal LPs, normal CAT scans. I think they might have abnormal MRIs, but we haven't been doing those yet. And they, they tend to get better if you treat them. And I think the thing that um, we need to be aware of is it's we, they, they, they're seeing this in adolescents and young adults as well. So if you get someone coming in, you need to think, could they be this post-inflammatory? Um, yeah. And Jill, that tr treatments with intravenous immunoglobulin? Yeah, so, um, the, you know, there haven't been studies, but I think because of the cardiac abnormalities and the response with IVIG in Kawasaki's, most people are too scared not to treat with IVIG. Um, but it would be IVIG and steroids quite often um, if they're very sick. And then the weird thing is some children get better with no treatment. Um, yeah, and then, and then the, the dilemma for us is the anticoagulation because children will have very high D-dimers, but often they they don't seem to have as many thrombotic episodes. So. Cool. Okay, so um, I think we've come to the end of the, the hour. Thanks very much to Audrey and to Jeremy who have a wealth of experience. Thanks for the um, uh, very, uh, uh, thanks for the, the robust discussion and interesting cases. And I think the clear message is, you know, 
uh, COVID is a multi-system disease. Look for, think about unusual presentations because we need to have infection control in hospital and public health responses. I think it's, we are still learning and we're certainly going to learn lots about the post-acute COVID syndromes. And don't forget common diseases. I think we've been so focused on, uh, on COVID. We, we really have to think a lot more broadly as the COVID cases go down. Don't miss them, but don't miss other things that need treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. And, and thank you, Jeremy. And thank you, Audrey, uh, for another brilliant session. I think we're very, very privileged to have uh, such great people joining us. Uh, Mania, you can just confirm as well, but I think this will be our last session for this, well, uh, for this week. We did originally have a session scheduled for Wednesday. However, our, our speaker, unfortunately, is no longer able to make it. So our next session will likely be next week, Wednesday, which will be the 9th of September. Uh, Mans, is that correct? That's correct, Chris. Thanks. Perfect. All right. Thanks uh, very much. Cool. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Jeremy. Have a good evening. And we'll see you all next week, Wednesday, 9th of September. Thanks a million, everybody. Bye.